there are 10 records that you, somewhere, one of you, don't have. I can't be so presumptuous thinking that no one out there of the thousands of people watching this video that are going to watch this video doesn't have at least one or more of these records. Of course, someone does. But TKR, TRK channel. Oh my God, I got dyslexic. TKR, TRK's channel. I'll put a link below. Is having, doing this thread contest. Show 10 records that other people in the vinyl community don't have. Now, I want to go beyond the vinyl community. Of course, in the world, people have these. But I think uh, these are amongst, not necessarily the rarest, but, um, and not, it's not, this is not a financial measurement of rareness, but, you know, things that I think it's interesting to show that I've never really seen other people have, even include, including uh, friends of mine, except for a few people back, maybe in the record business, my record business days, back decades ago. So, uh, first I have a stack of 45s, I think are kind of fun and interesting. And I have a few uh, albums and I have a special personal record that I have shown years ago, but now with all these new subscribers, you probably don't know about it. You haven't seen it and you're gonna hear it at the end. I did play it on one of my videos several years ago. Let's start with this promotions promotional single uh, from 1969 capital records it's a um i believe it's a 33 and a third single and it's promotional capital records it's a son to champlin jesus is coming part one and part two and it starts on a side one and it continues on to side two now i'm a big fan of uh the first son to champlin album Oh, God, I wasn't prepared. I should have been prepared. All-time favorite mine, one of the great uh, sort of ballroom bands of San Francisco in the 1960s, Fillmore, Avalon, The Sons of Champlin. What was unique about them, they put out this album in 1968. Uh, that's horn bass. So it, it was around the same time as Chicago Transit Authority's first album. They're more jazzy. They have vibes, psychedelic. Bill Champlin would later go on singing with the M.O.R. version of Chicago later on, but this is a fantastic double album. Funky, soulful, psychedelic, and uh, when that album came out, and I can't remember if it was through Capital, it came with an insert, or the local radio station said you could send in to Capital to get this promotional signal. So that would have been 1968, actually. And um, I wrote my name on it, actually. There you go. But I like this. It's, it's a long song. I don't know if it, it might have come out on a subsequent uh, CD where they tacked it on the end of the CD, but it's a good song. It's um, Jesus is Coming, not totally religious, somewhat secular, but just really a, a great, great single and uh, promotional copy, 1968. There you go, Sons of Champlin. Love me some Sons of Champlin. They actually, for a while, changed their name to Yogi Flem, which was a bad move, and then went back to the Suns. So I think they're together again after all this time. Now, this is an interesting record. This is from 1981, and this is a single, Allen Ginsberg with the Gluons. I believe the Gluons were kind of a new wave punky band out of uh, Colorado, I believe. And this is the poet, the great poet, of, of Howl fame and Beep Generation fame, and Bob Dylan, kind of associate later fame. Uh, this is his first foray into punk, and this is, I think, this is several years before he, he worked on uh, The Clash, with The Clash on their album. And the song Bird, ba Bird Brain is about Ronald Reagan, 1981, and it's really a great, great song. And he's reading his poem based on Reagan, Bird Brain. Side two is Sue Your Parents. And Allen Ginsberg with the gluons. These kind of independent, uh, kind of 45s. Uh, this is on Alicos Records. Don't know much else about it, but that's next. My next, now I'm going for a lot of the new wave, uh, punky bands, new wavy bands out of San Francisco that I got these independent singles. Uh, this is on a local 
Union Street label. I mean, everything was self-produced in those days, all these punk bands. And this is Eye Protection. Uh, Danny, oh, no, what's his name? Danny Pryboy, Preboy? Andy Preboy. I think he moved to L.A. eventually. Eye Protection, uh, I saw a lot playing around San Francisco. Uh, this is produced by John Kuhn, and this was 19... I'm thinking 1980, 81. I don't remember. 45 RPM stereo, 45. Single hole like the British holes. <laughs> like the British holes. That makes no sense. Um, 1979. 1979. There you go. They changed their name for a while to The Beef. The Beef. Horrible change. What's with these bands? They just can't leave it alone. High, High Protection was such a great name. And uh, they were a punk band. Andy Preboy was a, you know, a good leader, a good front man. And I think later went to L.A. I never followed him beyond that. Every once in a while I've heard his name again. But if anyone knows, Vinyl Richie, Richie, do you know Andy Preboy? High Protection, never see them. I did see them plenty of times. So there we go. Then we got another a San Francisco band. Uh, this has a tragic story for one of the members. And this is a single, Lila and the Snakes. Jane Doorknocker uh, was playing and performing with the tubes, uh, the whole idea of the tubes. And um, uh, Pearl, this is um, Pearly Gates, that's it, Pearly Gates, who actually uh, had records on her own started her own band, uh, Pearl Harbor and the Explosions, right? Yeah, Pearl Harbor and the Explosions. Anyway, uh, Jane Doorknocker played with the Tubes, <laughs> fun single, indie single, again, self-produced in San Francisco on ASP Asp Records. Now, Jane Doorknocker would later move to New York, and she became sort of the traffic person and one of the uh, New York local radio stations, and tragically, uh, one time during drive time, I guess, her helicopter crashed and she died way too young. A, a, a great talent, very personable uh, person, uh, Jane Doorknocker. Sad ending, but this is Lila and the Snakes. I saw all these bands playing around. They were just staples around San Francisco in the late 70s into the early 80s. Okay, now I got two songs, two records I'm putting uh, together, and one is an infamous lawsuit. But Dick Bright and the Sounds of Delight and Little Roger and the Goosebumps were playing these lounge, they did a faux lounge act around San Francisco at a place called the Red Chimney in Stonestown, old kind of old school uh, lounge, and they would play five nights a week, I believe, and it was hysterical. All these people would show up, everyone from members of Santana to to Dan Hicks to um, guests all the time performing uh, with them occasionally. And I did a parody of a lounge act. Uh, Buddy Love, Bud E. Love, who did sort of a parody of the uh, Jerry Lewis character of, of the original um, Absent Mind Professor? No, let's see one, Jekyll and Hyde one. You know what I'm talking about. Uh but this is one of their parodies. Little Roger and the Goosebumps did Kennedy Girls. It's basically a takeoff of um, Cinnamon Girl, the, the, the Neil Young uh, solo song. And it's, it's, it's so hysterical, Kennedy Girls, back with Bozo Chimps. And this is on uh, Richmond Records. Richmond is the a town across the bay north of Berkeley in the East Bay. But this is the one. This is, first of all, look at this. Kinks Sides, based on the Kinks, obviously. This is an, uh, an EP. And it um, starts out with So Tired by uh, Dick Bright and Sounds of Delight, with vocals by Little Roger and Victoria and All Day and All the Night. Now, the one I forgot, the one I meant to pull. Oh my God. Okay. Just pretend this is the record. I forgot to pull it, but it was also Little Roger and the Goosebumps, and they do a song. They basically do, <laughs> this is really good, and it's really, you should track this down. They got a cease and desist uh, lawsuit by Led Zeppelin. They did a version of Stairway to Heaven, the whole music, perfect, perfect rendition of Stairway to Heaven, using the lyrics of Gilligan's Island. 
And so it's the Gilligan, Gilligan's Island Stairway to Heaven record. And I have it. And I didn't pull it. So mea culpa again. I'm just apologizing left and right here on my channel. Uh, which I keep telling people never apologize when you make these videos. But um, anyway, Little Roger and the Goosebumps, Dick Bright and his band of delight. And uh, that whole entourage of Buddy Love were so hysterical and parody, but really good musicians and just really spot on. They had a great, you know, comic irony. And uh, But seek out that, uh, I can't even play it here, I don't think, the uh, Gilligan's Isle Stairway to Heaven. It's, it's wonderful. Okay. Staying with the theme of parody songs on Asinine Records out of Los Angeles, uh, this is... A Day in the Life of Green Acres. Basically, it's the same kind of thing. It's the, the lyrics of Green Acres. I think they stole the concept of doing these uh, mashups from Little Roger and the Goosebumps. See, L.A. just always rips off San Francisco. It's by Damascus and Barnes and Barnes. And you know Barnes on Barnes, they did Fish Heads. Fish Heads, Fish Heads, Roly Poly Fish Heads, which is Billy Moomy. Yes, that Billy movie from Lost in Space and Twilight Zone. And did a bunch of parody things. Dr. Demento used to play this kind of stuff all the time out of Los Angeles. So uh, this is uh, Day in the Life, obviously the Beatles song with the lyrics of Green Acres theme. The stores, the chores, fresh air, Times Square. Uh, but funny, Making Love in a Subaru. I don't even remember. I don't know if I ever listened to that B-side. So there you go. You don't have these records, do you? Someone does. Now this record... I don't know why I pulled this record, because I had it, and I don't even know why I have it. But I have it from my record store days, because it's a promo copy. And I have two copies of it. That's even that's even funnier. Who here has... And I could send one free to somebody local if uh, you want it. I know who I'm going to send it to. Never mind. I'm going to send it to someone in another package, so you don't get it. I'm sorry. This is on Columbia Records, and this is a promo of White Christmas. White Christmas performed by the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Side one is White Christmas. It's an EP. Little Drummer Boy. Side two is I'll Be Home for Christmas. The Christmas song, Chestnuts Roaching on Open Fire. And we all know who wrote that. That was written by uh, Mel Torme, right? Yeah, Mel Torme and R. Wells. But look at White Label Promo. How many people out there have a white label promo of a Morbin Tabernacle Choir single? Love it. Love it to death. See, records are your best entertainment value. They bring so much joy. Boom. Now I'm going to end up um, with two uh, 12 inches and then end up with a special personal 45. This was a promo only thing, and this is a Niels Lofgren live, an authorized bootleg. And in records, obviously Niels Lofgren, you probably know because of the E Street Bands with Bruce Springsteen, what, for at least 25 years now, maybe even more, maybe 30. Uh, what a great guitar player. Him and his brother had a band called Grin. Uh, they were on uh, first Epic, I believe, and then a uh, division of Epic, and then uh, a and Records. And... Great band. What a great guitar player. What a great performer. He's a, he's a short guy. And when you saw him live in the 70s, he would do backflips playing a Stratocaster guitar. Really good. His a &M songs are well worth getting. a &M was really trying to get him, break him. He got local airplay in the Bay Area and cer certain markets. I'm sure you've heard Niels Lockhart. Right now, uh, Back It Up Baby, that great song, uh, is wonderful. He covered um, Going Home, Going, what's the... Uh, uh, Carol King Goffin King Goffin song uh, going back going back a wonderful ver version of that really really good records on him all his solo records are fantastic this was from a live broadcast on KSAN radio in San Francisco it's a truncated version of that show and they sent this to radio stations and radio stations KSAN especially would play this it was so good they take out all the intro radio crap um, and it's really good of course, around this time, remember, uh, maybe just after this, a and breaks a live album by, at Winterland of Peter Frampton Comes Alive. And that is huge. And they still can't break this guy. 
all the people wanted AM, pushed AM to put this out commercially, and they didn't. This is, again, only radio station and record store people and record people. Of course, uh, that's why I got a copy from my friend at AM Records back in the day. I think it's the bootleg's actually been bootlegged. Of course, later on, after the fact, too late, not as good. AM finally puts out a double live album of Neil Lofgren and just doesn't happen so he's one of those artists he's so amazing so i'm glad that bruce springsteen saw his amazing guitar playing and added to the um e street band but his those AM solo records are magnificent they're really great 70s rock and roll however they have great uh songwriting so it's not like just the loud you know that van halen crap and stuff sorry sorry melinda um it's it's very melodic and very unique um, stylings. So that one. Another one. Do you have this? This is cool. This is a 12 inch. This is kind of noisy avant garde. Um, it comes with a, a CD. This is Yoko Kim Thurston. And it's autographed. There's 600 copies, 152 autographed by um, the Sonic Youth's Thurston, Kim, and Yoko Ono. It's a collaboration of the three of them. Thurston Moore, Kim Gordon, and Yoko Ono. It's multi-discs. Uh, kind of beautiful, arty work for the poster. And it's noisy. It's it's exactly what you would think that a combination of Sonic Youth and Yoko Ono would be. But it's really cool. And probably you don't have it. And probably you don't want it. Some people would not even want it. I'm going to get some Yoko bashers out there, but I love Yoko Ono. And I like uh, them. Now, lastly, and after this is over, I'm going to play this out so you can hear the whole thing. In 1966... My first band with my friend Larry, who I have his drum set, if you've seen my drum set, that's his drum set. He passed away uh, the year prior to me moving to Seattle. My friend Danny, who died over a decade ago of leukemia, um, he was the lead singer. He was like the uh, Davy Jones of the group. We started our first band, 12 years old garage band, and it was called The Silencers. And was named after the movie uh, The Silencers by um, the, the, the basically the the James Bond riff with Dean Martin. And there was a series of movies: The Silencers, The Ambushers, Murderers Row. But I believe the first one was The Silencers, and that's when myself and everyone my age fell in love with Stella Stevens, that beautiful redhead bombshell in that movie. Hey, come on, we're twelve years old; things are percolating. Um, so we call our band The Silencers. Yes, in the 80s, there was a rip-off band called The Silencers that had some uh, modest success, but we were the first ones. And Danny's father was a criminal attorney. Infamous number of years later, what, three years later, he uh, defended the Hells Angel, was it Sonny Barger, the uh, whole Altamont uh, murder trial. He worked with, uh, defended and represented Jim Marshall, photographer of gun and, and drug charges. That's what, but he uh, had a friend who had a recording studio or a client, I guess, I don't know, I was 12 years old, on Natoma Street, San Francisco. And it's 149 Natoma Street, Commercial Recorders, San Francisco. So he gets us to go to a recording studio to record these two songs we wrote. I Don't Care, written by Danny, and Blast Off, written by me, Danny, and my friend Tom Quackenbush, which is just a standard progression. I'm not going to play Blast Off. A-Side, I guess, if there is this called I Don't Care by Danny Walker. It's kind of punkish. I mean, we didn't have a bass player. We had guitar, singer, tambourine, uh, drums, Larry's on drums, and I'm on guitar. With my our, our vocals, like, we're going through a, a change. So we go to this place. The great thing is last year I was at the Museum of Modern Art and Natoma Street, that was a different, South of Market was totally different than work, uh, you know, in low industrial alleys, kind of cool in a way. During the punk scene in the 80s, it was really good in the 70s. Um, but right now, the Museum of Art in San Francisco, the, if you look out the back, the alley, you can see this building. It was like a three or four story kind of brick style building, an old 
ele freight elevator. I, I remember going up there. We recorded. We I think we did the tracks twice through. Only once was recorded, and then we double tracked uh, the vocals. And it's not very good. But we're twelve years old. They pressed five copies. There, I think Larry's copy is still around with his wife. I don't think any other copy existed. It's basically like an acetate. I mean, it's been played so much and it's kind of squirrely by now. But I'm going to uh, close off with I Don't Care. 12 year old boys in San Francisco, garage band. Uh, nobody has this. And I know this one for a fact. So thanks for watching. I'll pull a link down to the original, the OG version of this concept. There's a bunch of them around and I've been enjoying them. So uh, thanks for watching and, um, you know, I don't care. <laughs>